I think I can do this from here. Localhost 380. Okay, so we have this, uh, this one. I can select a uh, starting uh, language and a different one. Let's try it out. Ah, I need to allow. Okay. Okay. Adesso provo a parlare in italiano. Grazie per avermi invitato a questa conferenza. Ok, questo è un esempio. Io posso parlare nella mia lingua madre e voi, se leggete lì sotto, mi capite. Ok. Ok. The applause was not for the styling, I think. Ok, but it's fine. Without further ado, I'd love to leave the stage to Francesco Ciulla, the developer advocate at Daily Dev and Docker Captain. Francesco, your stage. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. This is my third time here at the We Are Developers Conference, so super happy about this. I want to talk about two of my favorite technologies and how those technologies help me to solve one problem that I had for a while. I'm Francesco, developer advocate at Daily Dev. I'm very active on YouTube and Twitter. I want to talk about the idea and the process to find an idea for a project, like I had for this presentation. Confession, I didn't have an idea for this app when I submitted the talk. Like, I don't know, I'll build, I'll build an app at some point. So I finally had the idea. I'll talk about the tools that I used to build this simple app. It's also an open source project, no worries, I'll share the links. We'll check the code and we'll, we'll explain line by line what, what it does, of course. And at the end, I have also a final surprises. I think we all agree that AI changed us in terms of Developers. So how many of you have ever used uh, AI to build something in the past two years? I think most of us. Is this all wrong uh, or not? Uh, I honestly think it's not, uh, but we are open to discussion. Some people say that you should not use AI, especially at the beginning of your career. I think there is nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I think that, for example, this solved uh, this, my issue kind of quickly, I would say, once I had the idea. How do you find an idea for, for a project? Let's say that you need to find a good idea, because probably you have nothing to do, you want to do something during the weekend, so you want to start a new project. What's the best, uh, the best way? We should start with a problem we have, and trying to find if, we, if there is already something exist, that exists. Even better of just uh, thinking about a generic problem, is to try to solve a problem you have. And I had many problems, but in the specific, I had one problem that I tried to solve. I asked all my friends, like, does this app exist or not? My problem, it was something about the language. And I had basically two issues, two problems. One, it was to understand a live stream in a different language real time. So during the live stream, I wanted to understand uh, what that person is saying. The problem that I wanted to solve is uh, this one. I want to make a live stream, like even this, uh, this event. I want to speak in my own native language and being understood. Do you know, any, uh, do you know an app that does this? Raise your hand. <sighs> okay. Now let's talk about two of my favorite uh, technologies. Okay, the first one is uh, Rust. I, I really went to, into the rabbit hole with this programming language. How many of you have ever used the Rust programming language with anything? Oh, nice, thank you. This, this really makes me really proud, really, really happy of this. So now I, I want to convince the people who didn't raise their hand. What is Rust? Rust is a compiled programming language this is the official definition, known for safety, concurrency, performance, great definition, but why? Why it would be interesting to learn uh, this new programming language? First of all, it's fast and powerful. When a programming language is fast and powerful, they are very hard, uh, hard to die, like, like C, uh, C++. It's used mostly for system applications, but what really made me start uh, wanting to learn Rust is that it can also be used for web development, for backend, even for front-end. This makes the process of learning something new very interesting, and also for 
the bad guys for the blockchain developers can also be used to deploy smart contracts. A quick disclaimer, Rust is not beginner friendly, so I would not recommend to learn this as your first programming language. I want to give two killer features why it would be worth learning Rust and what, basically what convinced me to, to, to use it. Rust doesn't have a garbage collector. A garbage collector is a, you know, a system that uh, frees from time to time uh, the memory in a program. Some languages, they have a garbage collector. Some languages, they make you handle memory manually. How many of you have ever handled the memory manually in C? I'm sorry. That's it. <laughs> Rust is different from both of them because it checks when needed. I will not go into the details, but there are features called ownership that basically try to solve this issue so you handle the memory, but not in a so hard way. And this is the second reason, the developer experience. I wanted to focus on the, on the Rust compilers. I don't want to mention languages in, uh, in which uh, the compiler can give some weird uh, mistakes. Java. It's something that happened to me many times that the, the compiler give a sort of stack of the error. Instead, the Rust compiler, even if you make a, a mistake, it really can help you. So I think it, it's, it's great. I consider the Rust compiler, you know, like an old, old grandma, like very annoying, but yeah, she wants the, the good for us. And now a very quick introduction to Docker. Now, who knows Docker? Perfect. Oh, nice. We're in, the, we're in the right place. So probably now I'll say uh, boring things. So let's see if I, everything I say will be, you know this. So Docker is a platform to build, run, and ship, ship application in a cool way. It uses this idea of, of containers. I like these uh, two definitions of containers because I think they really help to understand what, what's going on. One is from a logical point of view. From a logical point of view, it's a, a container is a, a single package software that does something, not very much complicated. But I also like a definition from a technical point of view. It's basically a Linux process. Technically, is a, a Linux process. It runs inside a single Linux process. You can even remove containers just checking the PID and just close it. The difference between container and image is, I like, this is not the official definition, but the an image is uh, like a blueprint, if you talk about like, like object-oriented programming, and a container is an instance of that class, just to have the idea. The idea of the containers is because uh, the advantage is that we can use uh, different versions for different projects at the same time. For example, if you are working on different projects uh, for, uh, for different clients. And this is a, a real problem because for uh, some technologies like Node.js, there is MVM, which is great to change, install, uh, switch between uh, Node, Node versions, but this is just Node. Maybe we don't code just in Node. Maybe we code in Rust or we code in Python, in Django. Sometimes the switching version is very hard. And for example, for databases, uh, for Postgres, uh, you can't even do this like locally without having like a virtual machine or like running two separate instances. So maybe we want to use different versions at the same time on the same, on the same machine. And this Docker really makes this very, very easy. Difference between containers and virtual, virtual machines. A virtual machine is a full blown operating system. And then instead, if we use containers, we have this other layer, which is the Docker one. But you see this container, this blue one, is just a process. So this makes all this process way easier. Docker uses this uh, client-server architecture when it basically talks to, to a daemon, the server, and the daemon handles uh, what they are called the Docker objects, images, containers, networks, uh, and volumes. We have also something called uh, Docker Hub, which is a sort of GitHub. So the client talks to this, uh, to this daemon, and they are remotely, they, they, they can be used remotely or locally using HTTP protocol and uh, uh, using REST API over Unix sockets. And yes, I stole the image from the official Docker, uh, Docker documentation. The main way to use Docker, like the classical way, using Docker desktop or other application is using these uh, Docker APIs, but then they can also be used uh, remotely, for example, if we want to connect with multiple daemons and then we get into more the orchestration part. What is a Docker image? A Docker image is a read-only 
template that contains all the instructions that we need. So it, it, it can have the configuration, the environment variables, and so on. We'll probably see, we'll see an example soon, of course. Interesting part is that we can start from existing images, or we can also start uh, even from scratch. Usually we don't do this, but ideally we can also do this. When we have an application, we write a Docker file, we create a Docker image, and based on the Docker image, we run the containers. Also, Docker uses a nice system of caching that makes things, uh, everything easier. A container, we will run that one today, uh, has its own dedicated file system that, of course, is ephemeral. So ideally, it should just be removed when we remove a container. And instead, the, and the image contains uh, everything I said before, including the dependencies, the binaries, and other data. Docker networks, uh, there are five types uh, of Docker networks. One is the default one when we run uh, the first containers. Okay, When we do the first examples, we don't, we don't even see that. But we can also use uh, the host network, for example, if we want to remove the isolation between the host machine and the container. The overlay network, if we want to connect different Docker daemons, so this is basically made for orchestration and swarm services, something I never used is the Mac VLAN, maybe more for legacy applications, if we want to connect to the Mac address, and also known, for example, for some tools we want maybe to disable the networking at all. Persistency, containers, are not persistent by, by default because they are processes, so we need a way to make them persistent. This is a problem that we didn't have with, with virtual machines. Instead of with containers, we need to find a way to make this persistent. There are three main ways. One is Docker volumes. It's the ideal solution. It's managed by Docker. It's a cross-operating system compatible and so on. You can also use bind mounts that maps directly to a host file system. I found this useful for local development, especially, for example, if you have a local configuration file. But this might become a bit complicated, for example, if then I switch to another operating system. Especially, you know, we know the slash backslash trick, uh, for example, from Windows and Linux. So it, it's good for if you have a, a local development. And then we have also TMPFS mounts that are used, for example, when we want to have uh, sensitive data. Who, who ever heard about this framework? Hmm. We are talking about a Rust framework, of course. There are many, but I think this is very simple. Especially because I, I think it's similar to Express in some ways. If this is the Rust project. How the, does this Rust project uh, look like? We have a cargo.toml file. Tom stands for Tom's Obvious Markup Language. It's similar to a package.json. I like the syntax. We have the package and all the dependencies. We are using these Actix web and uh, Actix files because uh, we are serving static pages for this example. We have serde and serde.json here at line 10 to transform objects in, in JSON format. There is a package called .env, which is not an, the npm one, but it has the same name. And it's also there is this uh, request that is basically to do HTTP request. How is this project structured? Let's check the, the non-Rust part first. We have an index.html file. It's very simple. We have a couple of um, drop downs and a couple of uh, really ugly buttons that you will see we will see soon. An app.js, I remind you that I wanted to translate uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying. And I'm using this uh, WebKit speech recognition, which is not an NPM package, but it's something like uh, embedded just to be used uh, on the browser. It's a very basic example, we will see. And then we have, uh, this is, there, is the, there is a bit the, the logic of this, like uh, if I start, if I stop talking, you will see hopefully a demo that hopefully look, look so, will uh, will work soon, and then we have uh, a function that translates the text. This is uh, the, I don't even know if I can call it a front-end, but like it's basically an HTML and a JavaScript uh, file. This app will not look good. The styles.css is empty. <clears throat> but let's check the Rust project. Let's uh, try to explain uh, uh, in details as much as possible. I don't know if you are familiar with the Rust uh, syntax, but we, I think it's understandable here. We are importing all all or some of the dependencies. Then we are using a uh, struct in Rust, which is, of course, used to have uh, compound types. And here we have uh, an input uh, text, uh, the, type, the, the source language, and the target language. We will see this soon. We have also a tone of voice. And then we want to also structure the response. Then we have this uh, asynchronous function in Rust that has, uh, you know, this, you see these types. I want to stop one second for the syntax. You see here we have request, 
and client has parameters, and we have to say the type. And then here we say the return type of the function. And here we have this, that it implements this, uh, this trait is OK. Then we get this open AI API key that are in this .m file that I'm not opening, of course. And then we have the prompt. The prompt is very minimal, because it just says, like, translate this text. This can be, can be improved just with a tone. This was just for the, for the example. And then we have this response, which is a uh, post request to OpenAI API. I'm using this model. This can also be, be improved with authorization. And we also, you see, we deserialize this object. We send this, this, and then we wait for that. And then we get this answer. And you see this match. I'm a huge fan of the match statement in Rust, because you see, I can match the response itself. We can think about the match statement as similar to a switch statement, but it can be done for HTTP requests. We are serving this static page, and we have something very similar to Express here. We import .env, we have the client, and then we start the service. And then we have this uh, request, cargo run. We are serving on, on port 8080. I think I can do this from here. Local host 8080. OK, so we have this, uh, this one. I can select a uh, starting uh, language and a different one. Let's try it out. Ah, I need to allow. OK. OK. Adesso provo a parlare in italiano. Grazie per avermi invitato a questa conferenza. OK, questo è un esempio. Io posso parlare nella mia lingua madre e voi, se leggete lì sotto, mi capite. OK. OK. The applause was not for the styling, I think. OK, but it's fine. I wanted to also see the Docker part. Super, super quick. So I, we have a Docker file. It's already here. We have a from, from, because we start from the Rust image, a working directory, because we don't want everything at the root level. And then we copy everything which is locally inside the file system of the image. We have also something called the dot docker ignore, which is similar to, to the git ignore. And then we expose this port 8080, and then we do the same command. This is not optimized, it's just to, to check it out. We have also a docker compose file. Compose is a, a uh, set of CLI commands and also a file. And here we have just one service with uh, a default container name, an image name, a build dot, which is basically building in this path. And you're using this dot env variable to do everything that we did before, but with Docker, we, do, we can do docker compose build. And I think this will take about one minute. Docker compose up. Since we are running this for the first time, probably taking some time, maybe in the meanwhile I can show something. Small surprise is uh, I made some work. I probably dedicated more time to style this than the whole presentation. This application is actually deployed and up and running. I'm also paying for the OpenAI, so take, take advantage of this. So you can try it, it out. You can check. The, I think I'll, there is a QR code later if you want to check this one. Let's see if Docker is still doing stuff. No. If I go on localhost 8080, we still, have, uh, we still have the application up and running. OK, I have 10 seconds left. So with 10 seconds left, uh, everything I can do, I think, uh, is uh, go here. So there is this QR code if you want to try it out. I will leave it here for a while. That's it. So I managed to solve uh, one of my issues. Thank you so much. I am Francesco. That's me somewhere. Huge shout out, of course, to, to Daily Dev for taking this up together. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Now we're going to have 10 minutes break. Don't forget to check out the expo area. And remember that at 6 p.m. we have...